Well, welcome everybody. My name is Jose Leal and this is Friday Talks. I'm a co-founder of Society 2045 and we are seeking positive visions for the year 2045. We do this by bringing pioneering voices together to help us envision the future we all want to see. And today's guest is Rachel Kahn. Welcome, Rachel. Thank you for joining us. Thanks for having me. So, Rachel, we start off with a, a short introduction. We don't really want to know too much about you, just enough to get pique the interest, and then we get into it as we explore what it is that you're doing towards the new future. Okay. <laughs> That's that's challenging. Okay, <laughs> it's short. It's short. <laughs> yeah, I guess um, I'm Rachel Sheila Can. I've been in the fashion industry for 23 years as a designer and design manager, um, and I moved into sustainability probably five years ago. Uh, and now um, my concerns are moving into consultancy, but also into building the collaborative. Um, which is bringing together all of the, um, the players of small brands, um, artisans, mills, designers, professionals together in small self-organizing teams so that they can think about economies of scale as one. Uh, so that's kind of it for now. But, uh, I th was that short enough? Jose? That was beautifully <laughs> short, but I want to know a little bit more about you. So, so you said... A bunch of years in the industry. Uh, what about your family? Like, oh. you've got two kids, two boys. I have two boys, um, and I'm originally from a working class family up north. Um, and actually, a lot of the um, societal problems I, I saw there firsthand. My father is mentally ill, um, and now um, also has Parkinson's disease. Um, and my mother was very severely depressed. So I saw really how the system harms people on the inner as well. And it always stayed with me for a long time on my journey. Um, and then, yes, I, I've got a young family. Um, I was with my ex-partner for many years, 21 years. <laughs> um, and yeah, two boys, two young boys. So um, I'm, I'm working around that. Um, and um, yeah, doing so many things. Well, thank you for sharing that because I always find that it's the personal stuff that motivates us to do certain things. And so that history des definitely helps us understand where you're coming from. So we tend to try to look into the future rather than look back. And, and that's the reason for Society 2045. And would love to hear your vision of what you would like to see in, in 2045. Wow, 2045 feels like a long way away. However, um, I do think about it quite deeply when I'm building with the ecosystem incubator um, because we build on a cathedral thinking base where we're not thinking just about the now, it's just about, okay, what can we actually create? So um, for me, in, in, in that lens for the fashion industry, I would like to see definitely a fairer industry, uh, one where everyone is thriving uh, within the system um, and no one feels kind of like they're a cog in the wheel um, and that they're working together for uh, their win-wins from for everyone within the system rather than it being a small percentage of people that, uh, that always collect all of the um, nutrients from everyone else. So, so for me, it's about fairness and it's about uh, ev being everyone to be able to, um, to work with their creativity uh, and their innate um, skills, I guess, or, or qualities, I think. Um, and of course, uh, to have more, obviously, circularity, sustainability, move towards the regenerative, um, but also for that to be in a locality creation. So for me, um, just putting circularity won't really work. It has to go into building in the locality and then having those communities of people um, co-creating and creating within um, 
even down to sort of the smallest postcode. So I think I'd see that as being most prominent, that everything will come much more into the locality and it will be about the interaction and interconnectivity of everyone and everything that will be important. So give me a, a I'm loving that picture because that, that resonates a lot with me, but what, what, what is it that you see from the perspective of a typical person who is used to going to the fast fashion stores and purchasing clothing and, and so forth? Uh, how does their life change? How, do, how do, does the average person's life change in your vision that you've just described? I think that they, on, they, help, they will have more meaning um, on, on the things that they do purchase or do get involved with because it will be far more interconnected. They'll understand who's made it. They'll understand how it's made and where all of the components have come from. Um, and I think we've lost a lot of that um, over the years, you know, um, I think someone said to me the other, yeah, someone said to me a few years ago, they didn't have any idea about the fashion industry. They said, is it, is it made by robots now? I'm like, no, it's still made by many people um, in many different countries and it's shipped all over the world and all of that stuff. Um, so for me, I think it will be that, um, that innate bond with, with, with the thing that they're they're using that that is something that they'll have an emotional attachment over time and it's one thing that I've started looking at creating already with with a brand idea of an, a, a garment that evolves with you as you as you grow you know <laughs> not that you can make it grow as it when you're a child but when when you're a, a youth you can you can have it with, live with you you know yeah so I think that it will be an a, a, um, a much more in-depth knowledge about where everything's from how it's made who's made it and probably even knowing the person that made it so it's about the connection yeah it's about connection yeah and the, and the meaningfulness of that connection yeah because it's not just then um you know a piece of clothing that that doesn't have a a life you understand where it's from what it's what it's made of you'll understand what quality is because i think a lot of people have lost what the knowledge of what quality is in in our trade anyway for sure and you at the same time are talking about even knowing the person so it's also about belonging yeah yeah for sure and if you know the person you're more likely to have an emotional response to that thing so you're less likely to say well let's kind of throw that away because it, you're the custodian of it, right? You're, you're someone that, that then will either give it to someone else who will want it more, or you will evolve it and upgrade it and, you know, or, or change it into something else, even if that something else is for your child as you grow grown older, you know? And so that's, that's, that feels to me like very much what's missing in in my life as far as the relationship to the things that I purchase. Um, but how does that change in the industry? What does that mean for individuals in the industry now? Um, that, that you know, they're either designers and at the back end of that whole process of how things get to, to people's hands. Um, how do you envision designers and, and producers uh, changing um, yeah. how they work? I think it will move from um, economies of scale to um, small distributive, distributed um, production hives. So instead of it being like, okay, we all have to go to China, and there's nothing wrong with China, <laughs> it's actually really great, but instead of just doing the big thing, we actually move it down into a decentralized system where you have teams of designers, um, garment techs, pattern makers, um, machinists, whoever, in the locality so that you could go there and you can have things made either to order or on a very short run or very short instead of having to create 
sometimes I've been in, in, in the industry where you've created like 30,000 of one thing, you know, it's, it's insane. <laughs> so I think for that kind of um, more emotional attachment with a garment and who's made it, it has to come to decentralization overall. And that fits in with the locality thought process because then mm -hmm. you're thinking, okay, what can we create in, in the UK, for instance, which is like, well, okay, we can, we can have some sheep and we can do some things with wool. Yeah. <laughs> but um, again, there'll be different thought processes around farming, you know, and things like that. So obviously fashion is really linked to far farming for some of its things. So whether, whether it's sheep, whether it's um, cotton, hemp things like that mm -hmm. but that could be linked with the regenerative farming system so again it's that interlink interconnectedness of different systems that link with each other because in regenerative farming we should grow different multi multi crops together in one smaller location with all of the different animals and things like that so to me it fits with that lo new locality idea it also it builds an interdependence between all the participants as well right yeah because you and need each other on a smaller economic scale having nutrients shared you know and i do always do metaphors to the forest because it's it's always like in my mind uh, um, that money and intelligence and um connections can be a shared thing it doesn't have to be like that's my connection or that's my um intelligence because it's, it's shared everyone's got intelligence from the collective right anyway so um it's letting go and then seeing the the good that that does within those groups yeah that, so that's because because it's going to be different in every bioregion you know it's going to be completely different it's not like we can assimilate and say oh hey we're all going to make um this one thing that we can only get over here at this point in in the year we'll think about it in terms of seasons and stuff as well oh we can just make polyester any time of year oh yeah i can make polyester any time of year <laughs> don't get me started on polyester <laughs> <laughs> so you're not talking about changing the fashion industry you're talking about changing society yeah, well, it's both, I suppose. Society will change and they'll both evolve at the same time. And I think with my students, we, we always go, well, you know, who, who is the one? Because should it be government or should it be the customer or should it be the brands, you know, in the, the industry that are changing? I say it's a dance between all three, you know, and that, that, that when they do start to transform, it will lead itself and dance itself into that new space so i think it is both societal and it that then has knock-on ripples to the other parts you know right. right and i think that's why we called it society 2045 because even though we're all working on different aspects of society and certain things that one would consider uh, necessarily highly influential in society what you've just described for the fashion industry would be hugely influential from a societal perspective. Um, and you would think, oh, you know, fashion design, that will change the way the world works. And it does. Yeah. If you do it in a way that is human centric. Exactly the words I was going to say. Yeah. Because at yeah. the moment, it just feel, it does feel like it's very mechanistic in in the way that we are with it you know and ultimately someone in the system is going to feel put out or they're going to not get a seat at the table whereas if you move it into this decentralized way everyone feels acknowledged right like and i think people love to like to be heard and seen and and seen for their worth and be able to share their worth without kind of fear so what other uh, movements or, or, or groups are you kind of working with? Because again, it's about connection, it's about interlacing everything and interdependence. 
So who else um, are you starting to, or have you been working with? Um, like the specific people in the ecosystem or more sort of um, influential kind of? Yeah, other, other groups that are doing other aspects whose focus isn't necessarily um, the fashion industry, but you know that what they're working on complements what you're doing. Yeah, um, definitely in the built environment space. Um, Martin Brown has been doing a lot in, in that, and he has a, a series called um, something regenerative something. I can't remember what it is, but that's been influential in terms of how we inter link into industry. I shared with him the ecosystem and the, the forest idea, and he said, that would be amazing structure to put on what we're doing in in that in his industry as well so there's there's definite links with that kind of um uh, built environment space and also that we could utilize their waste or we could utilize they could utilize our waste into into what they're doing so again that's interconnectedness i think a huge influence has been um the regenerative leadership um book and journey that I went on um which like really was it was like the glue that brought everything together or the magnets I don't know <laughs> mm -hmm. it was because I'd already been trying on like a lot of stuff with how we create business with permaculture values and um I was on a Cambridge course and and the the moderate the the mentor said ah, you need to look at regenerative leadership, went into that and um, learned about living systems theory, regenerative structuring and regenerate, regenerative ideas for the product itself um, and all of the different structures that I could put onto what I'm doing in the ecosystem. Um, then the other people that I really linked with and aff affiliated with was Donut Economics, um, which has been a real interest of mine as, as to how we physically have different kinds of money flows, you know. So um, actually should be doing a, um, a workshop with them as well soon. So um, yeah, which should, should be really fun. Um, yeah, I think, gosh, um, the Reinventing Organizations by Frederick Lou um, was really influential in terms of how, how I structured the self-organizing teams. Um, so you can tell I've read a lot of books. <laughs> <laughs> um, gosh, who else? I, uh, also, I would actually say um, Alex Papworth and his um, team who were with, well, I'm with him on his team as well and we're doing a lot of nature connection. So for me, um, nature connection has been a really important part of um, grounding myself in nature, but also the theory of um, how we bring living systems and how, how, we, how we kind of use our metaphors of nature and put them into, uh, into our systems. Um, so that's been a nice physical dive into it. So most days I will take some time to go into nature and either think of a problem that's going on and and work with it in a living system support process um, or even an emotion that comes up so uh, obviously on the entrepreneurs or whatever i am this journey <laughs> um stuff always comes up for you that you you have to deal with on the inner so that that interconnection with nature has been a, a healing thing as well so I, i'll have to acknowledge that aspect of things for sure um, and then my business partnership with my partner who is also really helped on the inner stuff um, and the the kind of business positioning that um, I didn't particularly know about <laughs> so uh, but also what not he focuses on not what we are doing but how we are being uh, as well <laughs> at the same time <laughs> you're, you're hitting on all the buttons everybody here is oh, all yeah. those words you're using everybody's lighting up so uh you're hitting on everything that's awesome yeah <laughs> um, you, you know i must say you, you didn't mention the fact that you read our book uh, matt and my book but uh uh and i didn't expect that you would 
but you hit on all of the points that we we talk about in the book so you don't need to read it i will, it's I will say though as well you got you as well because um i wouldn't know the word collaborative if i didn't know you so your your website and your ideas helped me put a name on what it was i was creating because i think i was calling it collective or of course ecosystem or or that kind of thing but it really helped to galvanize what it was um because I, I was also using the cooperative language quite a lot but it still felt a bit me mechanistic um and and stuck like um yeah kind of st stuck in an in an old world mm -hmm. whereas when you share about the collaborative movement it feels more fluid uh, and 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 that's when I've been trying to, when I've been building the ecosystem. Yes, we've had to acknowledge that there is this economic world right now, and this is what we're in. But we've had to have that fluidity, um, not just for the members, but for the, how we create things and how we build the structures inside it. So yeah. um, thank you. Absolutely, that, I wasn't trying to get that. No, no, but, I, uh, I was just like it, it was just it was just that it's. It, you're hitting on every single one of our points in the book. And so that that feels really good because it feels that we're in alignment in a way that's special. Yeah, um, I'm sure there's so many more. It's just like there's 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 collectives of people that have helped and 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 talked with me over over these years. Um yeah, there, there's a there's a woman called um Hannah Loins Tai who who actually we we sat and spoke about living systems two years ago I think two and a half years ago and um she helped she we were just always bouncing ideas off each other and again with the original team that I had when I was doing my events they're always there and kind of you know um supporting and, and helping so so many people <laughs> we need them we yeah. need them right we need each other that's the way it works we need each other and that's why we're here it's to build that community and to continue to connect people to one another um so that's all the good stuff and i'd like to take a look at the, the the bad stuff what what do you think keeps us from moving these things forward keeps you from moving that vision that beautifully painted vision of of what it could be like what um what what holds you back <laughs> A lot of business as usual stuff. So uh, I think many people being in, not even knowing, I don't think m most people really know um, that they're being that way uh, and that's okay. So I, I'm not saying it's bad or wrong. I just, um, I, I generally tend to see people where they are on the journey and, and not say that I'm better in any way or anything like that. It's like, well, I ask them, to try it on so um so when i'm coming at it to them i might have different language with different people uh, and uh, you know not to talk down or anything like that it's just to meet them where they're at and then help them to try it on depending on where they're at you know um so i think for a lot of people it's business as usual it's them being in their own heads. Um, it's, um, it's they're stuck in the system itself, you know, like, okay, I, you know, and hand fear and things like, okay, I need a seat at the table, you know, and um, I have to be, you know, seen to be this way or that way to get there, you know? And, and so I think it's indoctrinated um, and, a lot of the issues are just them not moving into a new space with it which is not it's not it's not bad it's just okay how do we how do we facilitate that so I try not to be frustrated by it at all and in fact I moved into a state of being where um I'm like sand I'm very grounded but also very fluid at the same time. So whatever they say or do, da, 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 that's their stuff. Um, I be with whatever it is. 
and that has really helped to kind of stop that annoyance you know like oh why isn't it being why isn't it faster why aren't they doing this or that um and just to help them on the way with whatever it is that they need to be doing but in that the thought process of how we do it um, in the regenerative way that that speaks very well to the things that slow you down uh and, or potentially could yeah. um what what are the things that you think that are are happening or could happen that would systemically slow us down or slow you down hmm. um yeah that's an interesting question i'll have to think about it a minute. <laughs> um I think the, the control that is out there already um, is, is a difficult one. Um, and when I've, what, when I've read, um, I read a lot of Charles Eisenstein and he talks about control quite a lot. Um, so I, and I think we're so used to in this system being the ones that, okay, we have to like, put labels on everything, put legislation, da, da, da. When I feel that holistically, it could be, again, like I said, much more fluid. And when you come at it at, at uh, this locality idea where everyone's working together, you want to know how your neighbour is. You want to know how your garden is or how your farm is or whatever. You want, you want to do that. Whereas I think just some of the um, the power legislations that we have are, are not set up for that future yet. Mm -hmm. and I really think that you could decentralize a lot of the system itself. Um, yeah, so I think, yeah, um, that is a huge thing. Um, being obsessed with only one lever of success, um, GDP growth. Um, and not sort of how everyone's feeling or um, how the ecological ceiling is going on. <laughs> yeah. So I think GDP growth is a huge thing um, that stops every, that stops a lot of the progress, um, especially in my industry, because it's so set to growth. It's so set to the linear, linear economy um, that it's, it's hard for a lot. I, and I, get the bigger companies how, how they have trouble it's hard for them to come out of that space because they've got stakeholders they've got people that expect things <laughs> um, a certain percentage back or, or whatever so um yeah i'd say control legislation and um yeah the the lever of success that um that sounds like just pushing through from where we're at to something new uh, yeah. and just letting go of the old is is really sort of the biggest hurdle i reckon yeah i think for a lot of people it's hard to try on a, a different way of working because the system is so set to the the old old stuff of the industrial revolution and before yeah I really like that try on metaphor. Try on. It, yeah. That's going to be my book title, by the way. <laughs> so awesome. Try it on. <laughs> awesome. I like it. I like it. Kind of and it. It's a perfect fit with the industry. And, uh, yeah. and, and I really like the idea. It's, it, you don't have to do it. You just try it on. See if it works. Exactly. And See that's what I with anything that I'm doing is, okay, try it on. Come along for the journey. You can always put it back. You know, that's fine. <laughs> No, of course we hope they don't, but uh... no, we don't. I hope they wear it and think it's amazing. <laughs> so <laughs> but it, it also is, you know, it might take a few tries to try something new as well. It's not like okay, the people might get it straight away. And and some people don't. Um I'd had a few times when people had come along to the ecosystem incubator introductions and they'd been 
in a state of separation. So, okay, well, how, how do, how, how, I don't want to lose my IP or, you know, um, competition came into play. But when they came back, because it was like, okay, that's intriguing. How, how does that work? <laughs> so, so then they came back and, and now they're some of the most brilliant collaborators, you know? So it's having that um, ability to not make it feel, you, you know, I don't feel bad about it if they don't, if they don't buy it, that's fine. Or if they don't understand, okay, well, good, you know, come back later, try it on another day, you know? <laughs> so. Yeah. No, I really like that. Listen, I could talk to you all day. You, we, we, we know that because we've had yeah. a few conversations and we don't we want to stop. We can go for a long time, Jose. <laughs> we, uh, can, we can go and, for hours. And I, uh, I, I really do want to continue just talking with you, but, but I, that's not fair because I want to give everybody a chance to, uh, to uh, participate. So why don't we open it up for questions? I see Ken's all ready to go. Um, Ken, do you want to go ahead and step in? Yeah. Nice to, I, I loved listening to you. And it's really interesting because I was working with the Caring Group this week. Do you know Caring, K-E-R-I-N-G? Caring Group, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I don't own a single bit of Gucci or any Brioni or anything like that. I, I'm a Wan Zen, <laughs> L.L. Bean guy, you know, but um, very interesting to be there. They're very committed to sustainability, by the way. Um, I don't have a lot of details on how they're working that out, but I can tell the people that I, I worked with are they're concerned about the state of the planet. So that was a really great sign and they are looking at sustainability issues. So that brings me to, you know, the food industry and the fashion industry are two industries with enormous amounts of waste. Food industry is not so bad in terms of waste in, in, as far as biology goes, because food breaks down into biological components. But the fashion industry, we mentioned polyester, there's a lot of waste that comes out of clothing that does not, um, it's not healthy for the environment. So I'm just curious, what are you seeing people embracing this and um and how are we how are people tackling the issue of clothing waste because i think it's an enormous thing um i actually have um two or three people on in the incubator who are waste to wear brands um so one utilizes the waste from the industry um so there's generally a lot of waste just on offcuts of old rolls of fabric all of that kind of stuff so she takes it she's in sri lanka utilizes all the waste and and makes things out of that one is utilizing waste from a different system so they're using seat belts uh, and turning them into bags because the seat belts would just be incinerated or they'd be put in landfill just to sit there for many 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 hundreds of years um, and they're also a social enterprise so they help the the people in brazil like have food and stuff like that as well and then another one is over in Chile. Um, they are working with um, post-consumer waste of jersey and, and, and knitwear, and they're chopping it all up. Uh, and then they're making it back into yarn that can be used for hand knitting, um, which is really exciting to see. Uh, and one guy has been doing that kind of thing as well with just wool, woolen-based stuff out in um, Sheffield up north in, in, um, in the UK. And that, that industry has actually been going for 200 years uh, already with that. So circularity sometimes isn't a new thing. It's something that we can uh, look at the past for. So yeah, he's got an operation. He's one of the last people that know how to do it, the art of um, gathering all of the different colors together, bundling, it, bundling them in a certain way, and then uh, being able to move them into another space. So I think there's gonna be there's a lot of people looking at waste. Even one of the other designers in our incubator, she, she's using trampoline beds to make tops out of and things like that. So there's like so loads of innovative ideas just utilizing the waste. But going forward, when we were looking at how we can uh, how we can do create things, whether we're creating new things when we create when we create them, how how do we create them so that they have longevity? Um, so that they can be com uh, composted, home composted and things like that. So we are working with some regenerative suppliers um, out in India. You have a regenerative um, collective in a small central, in a small location with the centralized um, artisan units um, that create uh, amazing cotton that can be, is 
completely naturally dyed, completely regenerative, uh, and can be composted. So I think um, it comes to the two stages, utilising the waste that we have and giving it a new life in that one, and then find it whatever we're creating now, finding the most regenerative way of doing that and with the most longevity. Hi. Um, an idea popped in my mind while you were speaking, and that is um, Nespresso. Nespresso machines, the coffee yeah. machines. When you, when you buy some Nespresso, they give you a recycle bag, which they actually pay for. In mm -hmm. other words, you just you know, fill it up with your, you know, pods of coffee. I don't use it that much, but then you send it back, you know, into the company and whatever they do by way of recycling. So just the idea that when you buy a new item of clothing, that there is some vehicle for recycling that so it doesn't end up in a landfill. I don't know exactly what that looked like, but it just seemed like tying up that loose end um, might in some way be a good idea mm -hmm. completely yeah um i think the brands keep it keeping hold of the responsibility for the item that they've created is really important part and that's what we're building into the ecosystem as well so that especially for small brands it's difficult to do that um, because the system is set up to scale so uh, again it will be a collective and collaborative collection of all of those things that they can go back either into the industry recycling system or back through say John's system if it's wool it can go back to John up in Sheffield and he can chop it up and make it into new yarn and things like that um yeah or, or then into industry pl places as well so that our waste from the ecosystem could go into the built environment for instance or something yeah, and this is, you know, this picks up on, on Jose's comment about the importance of collaboration, because just in you and I talking, the, the next idea was, you know, brand stores for um, recycled clothing, the vintage brand, a brand store for vintage clothing. I mean, that just, you know, another idea popped in my mind, but, but thank you very much for what you're doing, important stuff. Thank you. Yeah. Some of the questions have already been, been asked and answered, but to follow up on the idea that Stuart just threw on the table, on the table you talked about industrial keeping ownership and all that stuff. There's this uh, company back east, um, and I can't remember the name of it now, but um, what they do is they rent carpets. So they don't sell carpets, they rent Carpets. Yes, I know. No. They're carpet tiles, people. And and yeah. they they take some of the tiles, they replace them, and everything always looks new, and they take it back, and then they they recycle it in the industrial scalable ways. So yeah. that's another another thought: is you rent the dress, or you rent the pair of pants, and although I would only rent jeans, but. Um, but then you turn your old jeans and you get your new jeans. That would be a good idea. Yeah, um, yeah, yeah. And yeah, also, I... uh, as, um, as Jose mentioned, you mentioned a lot of things. Centralization is an obstacle. Um, the established systems is an obstacle. And that's all, that's all stuff that we're facing. So we need to learn from each other and, and build on what each other does. Yeah, for so, sure. Can you tell that we're uh, problem solvers? Yes, we're all like idea, ideas, you know, we got Same ideas. Here. Like, I'm always like ideas, ideas, ideas. This is why I love the collaborative stuff because it's, I can share ideas with people and they might want to do them with me. Yes, <laughs> instead of it just being me, <laughs> you know. So I, I shared about, um, and you were talking Matt, about like the reuse of stuff. I think there needs to be a facilitation of that because they'll have one life, but also how we can make that life be longer and have it evolve either with the person or with the person that takes it on. So we were looking at whether we could do locality trend stations where they come in, they have their stuff, which might be affiliated with a brand or whatever. And you might've been paying sort of some kind of club membership to be in this trend club. And you could go somewhere super cool and get them to like an artist to, do something cool on it or someone to upcycle it and stuff like that 
Um, and I just thought that that, especially if the garment is designed in, in a way that it is um, interchangeable um, and, and changeable in terms of its size, et cetera, uh, and uh, non-genderless -gend uh, and everything like that, all those cool names that are, are, that are about right now, that that can um, then have an evolution rather than um, rather than it be having a linear end or even having to be composted, it could be be sort of facilitated longer. There, there was something you said early, and it just sort of it, it triggered whether there's a dimension of narrative and connection in the manufacturing supply chain sourcing chain and the end user mm. that is begging to be connected. Completely, yeah. So that the end user becomes sort of more consciously aware of all of the people and all of the sources and all of the value contributions, where they came from and, um, you know, in service to and maybe, you know, poke the responsibility um, uh, energies in, you know, the people that are on the receiving end. Completely. You know, because what, what, what keeps coming to mind is um, there's a, a harbor mission place where I live and they're community centered and clothes can be dropped off and they're free. So anybody in the community that needs can come and go through. Um, but it always strikes me in those places, how many things are being dropped off with price tags on them? Gosh, yeah. There is. You know, like the consumption freight train run amok. But, um, you know, there's just massive um, flow yeah. without, without attachment of, you know, value necessarily on an energetic level there's actually enough clothes in the whole world right now to service us you know they Everybody. might not be of best quality <laughs> but you know there is enough out there my my bugbear is that they haven't been always created in the best intentions in terms of quality longevity thought process about the afterlife all of that kind of stuff so Although there's all of that stuff that, yes, you can go and give to thrift or whatever, you know, like really that isn't answering the question. It isn't. And what we need to do is look at like what we're creating and it's it's entire life, you know. Um, yeah. So essentially your point about the supply chain. Yeah, there's like lots of people have, have tried to showcase the supply chain, but there's just no. There's no, there's still no emotional attachment for some reason, whether that's because it's all made in different countries or we don't want to see. And I did, I did actually interview someone who was a, um, who's a fast fashion addict. They, they, they love it. They, they're one of the influencer people. I met her at an event one time. I said, you know, how do you, do you kind of think about the supply chain? It's, like, it's almost like I don't, she didn't want to think about it. She just wanted to go and get the stuff and, and that was it, you know, and she knew that she knew that there is one and there is a supply chain and it, wherever it's come from. But for her, it was so separated that it just felt, she just felt like she wanted to do this. Right. So a, I suppose it's a bit like, um, being vegan or something you know like once you've understood the if where meat comes from and stuff like that and you understand the right. interconnectedness then maybe you be like okay i kind of get that a bit more um so there's there's something missing on the emotional connection to where things are being made and who's making them i, I just have to have to jump in and, and interrupt pardon me yeah. um just to punctuate that point, Rachel, um, it was probably five, seven years ago, I looked in my closets and I said, oh, I have enough clothing to last the rest of my life. I don't really need anything. And if some way that kind of consciousness can be part of the fashion consuming process, 
wow okay just just wow mm -hmm. yeah that, I mean, that'd be a that may thing. have sorry i was going to say that may have a lot to do with our age and gender <laughs> no, I'm the same. I'm the same. I'm 42 and I'm the same. I'm reduced down so much and I don't actually need a lot of it anymore. Mm -hmm. You know, like it's as long as it's got longevity, I'm like, well, I don't need anything else. So the, the issue is that, you know, though if it hasn't been designed with longevity, it starts to rip and it starts to. De you know, de degenerate, de de degenerate, degenerate, is that a word? <laughs> degenerate. <laughs> yeah. um, so we, we've got three more minutes. Uh, Mark, thank you for what you're doing thank and you. where you've been. <laughs> yeah. And how it's so interconnected. It's, it's, it's fascinating. And yeah, to your point about the letting in, letting out, I've got some clothes from the 50s also. They they have outlived my uh, some of my high street stuff. Biggest seam allowance, so that if I did get larger, uh, then I could take it out. If I did suddenly grow taller, I could uh, take <laughs> make it longer. <laughs> there is a company out there. Was one company out there that is doing that with like a dress thing. So um, I'll try and get the link to you, Jose, because it's super interesting. But yeah, yes. it's making that cool though. Like for, especially for a lot of a lot of people, they need it e easy on a plate and they need it to be cool so that they can right. gain. Because fashion is about being cool. It's about being sexy. It's about uh, the way that your image and the way you look, especially for the youth as well, you know, so. <laughs> Thank you so much. It was great meeting you and hearing this. Jonathan, great meeting you too. Sounds like it's time to wrap this up. Yeah, no problem. Rachel, thank okay. you so much. It was, uh, I really, truly enjoyed this conversation and I, I really um, hope that we have an opportunity to engage in other conversations. Um, and thank you for taking the time and being so good at answering the questions that we had for you today. Thank you so much. Thank See you. you soon. Thanks.